Tonight, how science is helping save oysters, shoring up supply for the state and beyond. And one step closer to a fast food development in Port Lincoln with approval on road changes. This is Southern Cross News with Tim Hatfield. Good evening. The fight to save the South Australian oyster industry from disaster continues with a new hatchery soon to open near Cal. The biosecurity facility will be able to produce over 3 million spat every year, helping to overcome a shortage due to the outbreak of POMS virus in Tasmania. This shed just outside Cal is leading the fight back against the POMS disease outbreak in Tasmania. A shellfish hatchery is weeks away from full completion. Strategically, if POMS ever came to South Australia, Hatchery here can then respond straight away, as we did in Tasmania, to ensure recovery of the industry. Natural algae is grown and fed to baby spat, which are grown in a controlled environment before being distributed. The facility is biosecure, with strict controls in place to produce both the spat and feedstock. We then add as it said, natural algae to boost that up to a feeding rate that is optimal to the oyster. In a six-week period, 40 million oysters can be produced, with potential to help rebuild struggling populations. There's also strong environmental protections, with solar powering the site and water recycled into Franklin Harbour. What goes out into the harbour is effectively the same water um, with oyster feces. The company is significantly owned by local oyster farmers and employs 10 people. Shareholders got a tour of the site yesterday, ahead of its completion in the next month. Farmers say the ban on using Tasmanian hatcheries has nearly crippled their business and this new operation will safeguard their future. If this hatchery or hatcheries uh, weren't uh, set up in uh, South Africa, Australia, um, and there would be no oyster industry. We would have all, all fallen over. In Cal, John Hunt, Southern Cross News. Hungry Jacks could soon be selling their famous Whoppers in Port Lincoln after the council approved a major hurdle with the new site. Service station Giant On The Run has been working with the city to map out a traffic management plan in conjunction with the new London Street Bridge in the hopes of pushing through the fast food development. Port Lincoln Council has removed a major roadblock in the Hungry Jacks development, approving the traffic management plan for the site. The acting mayor confident the fast food giant will soon set up shop. As far as I'm concerned, they've ticked all the boxes and it probably will go ahead. This was the third amendment of the traffic management plan after previous designs did not meet council expectations. Their major concern, access from nearby roads to the Hungry Jacks site. The councillors themselves uh, rejected the traffic flow. But they thought there was a problem here with the London State Street Bridge and King Street. Developers elated with the outcome. We're thrilled with the council approval. This is great news for On The Run and the community of Port Lincoln. Monday night's vote now paves the way for the next level of assessment under the Development Act. On The Run welcoming the next step with plans to push ahead. We'd love to think we could have open before Christmas but the pre-construction process will push us to early 2018. Councillor Starkey says the fast food outlet will provide a welcome addition to the local economy. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm sure that there will be opportunities for young people to work in Hungry Jacks. 50 jobs will be involved in the construction of the project and then up to 30 retail jobs again taken from the local community will be created once the Hungry Jacks is open. Jason Kemp, Southern Cross News. Our Broken Hill solicitor says additional funding is desperately needed to help families who are struggling through the family law courts. She says the federal government's budget commitment to family law and family violence services do not go far enough. An $80 million commitment, but Rachel Storey says there needs to be more. The government has given further funding to our federal courts, but basically it just doesn't go far enough. Ms Dory says while the federal government's $80 million would go to helping with urgent repairs to the family law system, she still has some major concerns. There are massive uh, shortage, uh, shortages of judges at the moment in the federal courts uh, to hear family law problems to the point where family law cases are extending out two, three years. She says justice delayed is justice denied. And you're dealing with really fraught cases as well, you know, parenting matters, property matters, things like that. And if those matters aren't dealt with, then um, the disputation just continues. The Far West Law Society wants to see more judges to hear cases and psychologists and social services to deal with any disagreements as cases continue.
She says there is no family law legal aid for poverty and family matters and that they are being referred off for mediation when they should be resolved in court. So we're advocating for the federal government to give more money to legal aid and to our federal courts um, to do their job. Patrick Reinke, Southern Cross News. Well, with help for farmers sometimes far away, St John's is now offering a three-day course to train farmers in first aid for longer periods of time. They say it could help make a difference in the crucial moments when waiting for emergency services to arrive. National Farm Safety Week reinforces the importance of knowing first aid when living and working in rural areas. Knowing first aid, even if it's basic, can mean the difference between life and death in, in some situations. I guess we just try to make sure that everything's done safely and properly rather than trying to cut corners. The moments after an accident are the most crucial and with help sometimes far away, farmers need to know how to care for the injured while waiting for help to arrive, however long that may take. But farmers are often isolated and it takes time for um, an ambulance or, or other services to get to them, so those, those minutes are vital. St John's in Port Piri offers first aid courses every two weeks and a three-day remote areas training course will be held there as well, providing there is the demand for it. Uh, the remote area first aid course is a three-day course that we offer and what it involves is basically looking after someone for an extended period of time, to put, put it very simply. We certainly hold them in regional centres as well. We've got a, a, the St John's Centre in Port Piri, of course, we could use. Many local farmers keep first aid kits in every vehicle and near heavy machinery to ensure help is readily available in the event of an emergency. Yes, so everyone on our farm is trained in first aid uh, and I like to think they all know how to react um, if, the, if the incident arose. Rachel Nell, Southern Cross News. Well, stay with us. Still to come in tonight's local news, Wayala given the all clear after a citywide asbestos scare. The details ahead. <laughs> Welcome back. Wyala's asbestos scare has been declared over after remedial work to remove identified mulch has been completed. Council says residents can now be assured their properties and public spaces are safe for use. Last month, Council revealed a batch of mulch from the local landfill tested positive to containing asbestos. Since then, it's worked with residents to identify, test and remove potentially contaminated mulch. The process now of removal and remediation and testing has all been completed. Uh, so all the contaminated mulch has now been removed. 13 residential properties and five public spaces, including Ada Rain Gardens, have been worked on. Furthermore, airborne testing has also come back negative, meaning no asbestos particles have been detected. Mr Cowley says he believes the scare was caused by asbestos being brought into the dump. Our estimation is that it's come in with a trail load of material. Uh, someone has hidden it in, in the material and it has, has inadvertently gone through the mulching process. A review is also underway on how Council manages the situation in the future. I was pleased that our procedures did stand up to scrutiny, um, although there is always opportunities for improvement and we're going to take those opportunities. But it spells the end of selling mulch, with Council set to dump the practice. The cost of me ensuring that it's safe uh, is, would make it um, not an economic proposition to continue selling to the public. John Hunt, Southern Cross News. Port Pirie's city park is in for a well overdue makeover with its last redevelopment in 1988 to commemorate the bicentenary. Council has now received a grant worth over $400,000 for the upgrade. The much-needed makeover follows Stage 1 of the CBD upgrade. City Park hasn't been well maintained over the years with vegetation forming a barrier from the main street. The aim of um, the upgrade is to open up City Park uh, to the street and make it more of a civic meeting place uh, that complements the, the admin centre here for Council. The grant, worth $446,000, will be combined with other council funds for the $1 million makeover. By uh, securing this funding through the state government, we will uh, uh, be able to really bring alive this, this space, which is in the centre of the city, is such a key location within the, the CBD of Port Pirie. 
With new paving, landscaping, public shelters and art being installed, City Park is set to become an iconic landmark in Port Pirie. But we're also looking long term at stage two of the CBD upgrade for the other streets around our city to, uh, to really bring uh, Port Pirie into the modern age. The newly renovated space will hold community events and complement the council administration building with hopes to move the main entry to come off of City Park. Rachel Nell, Southern Cross News. Well, after announcing the winners of the Mulca Aboriginal Art Prize, the Port Augusta Cultural Centre is hosting another display. In the new exhibition, a young gun artist from Wilmington is showcasing his work, drawing inspiration from the Flinders Rangers. A painting named Our Language Matters has been crowned the Molka Aboriginal Art Prize winner. After a month of displaying the work of many Aboriginal artists in the region, tomorrow the walls of Port Augusta's Yalta Pertley Gallery will now be filled with one local artist's work. I'm open for about six weeks. So definitely come on in and see what, see what Joel's done, He'd see his artwork, it's amazing. Joel Plevin, a 20-year-old artist from Wilmington, paints both the local landscape and more colourful pieces. Well, I really enjoy the abstract sort of figurative painting, I think it's called, where you've sort of got realistic figures but you bring a lot more colour into it. Always starting with his signature orange background. I do that because it sort of brings a warmth into your painting. Like when you've got a good light on it, you sort of see the orange coming through and all my paintings sort of glow a little bit. So It's all hands on deck as it's out with one exhibition and in with the next. This is local artist Joel Plevin's third display here at the Yarta Pertley Gallery. We can go on different things, go on colour, style, size. It just depends what works and what's going to look best and how it's all going to fit. Joel painted Sacred Canyon on location and says he prefers the abstract style. But when you're doing abstract, you sort of got to create something. You're making something that's not real, making it kind of look attractive. Joel's work will be on display for the next six weeks. Amelia Simpson, Southern Cross News. Well, stay with us. When we return after the break, almost showtime again. The countdown is on in Port Lincoln, and this year is looking bigger than ever. The details ahead. <laughs> Welcome back. Four New South Wales Australian of the Year Award winners have been doing a tour of Broken Hill. The four recipients have been meeting with the region's school students, sharing their stories with the city's brightest young minds. Passing on valuable life advice to Broken Hill's future generations. One of the speakers was none other than local volunteer Josephine Peter, who was the 2017 New South Wales Australian of the Year Local Hero nominee. She was joined by her fellow award winners Dr John Knight, Arthur Aller and the New South Wales Australian of the Year, Dang Adut, as they visited the city's primary and secondary school students today. About the children to understand uh, where they're going to go in the future and uh, that there are you know, recognitions for high achieving, uh, not, uh, not necessarily scholastically, but uh, within their community. The four speakers all had different messages to impart onto the kids, from volunteering and helping your community to continuing to fight when you're down in life. Deng Adut shared his incredible story of how when he was six years old and living in the Sudan, he was taken from his mother and forced to fight in a war that split the country. He was told to kill or be killed. He said he was smuggled out of the Sudan and into Kenya before arriving in Australia in 1998. He couldn't speak a word of English back then. Now though, he is a criminal lawyer studying for a second master's degree and is the co-founder of AC Law Group. I was telling them um, how, to be, how to be courageous about this, their, uh, themselves and how to actually uh, learn uh, a lot of things from my experience. He also spoke about not being selfish in life, citing Josephine's 77 years of volunteering as a special example. That is a matchup. That is, I think, that is what is missing uh, in this generation and is even miss, uh, missing in, in our daily life nowadays. You see people fighting for no reason, people arguing for no reason, and it become, you know, shocking. So we have to uh, rebuild our spirit, and that is what I try to do here. Nominations are now open for the 2018 Australian of the Year Awards. Patrick Roenke, Southern Cross News. The countdown to the annual Port Lincoln show has begun, with this year set to be the biggest on record. Locals will experience some high-class show jumping, animal and produce competitions, while favourites like the show bags and Sideshow Alley will return. Roll up, roll up. 
The countdown to the Port Lincoln show is on. The annual show has been a staple in the town for over a century, but coordinators are steadily preparing for their biggest yet. Yeah, only three weeks to go to the show, but um, once again we're busy, busy in the pavilion and getting ready for it. This year's highlights will feature new classes in competitions from cake making to flower arranging, plus show jumping which provides the perfect stage for equestrians to fine tune their routines before competing in Adelaide. A lot of the hacking um, equestrians that are involved here go to the Royal Adelaide show in a couple of weeks after our show, so it's a good um, warm-up for them. Locals can expect all the old favourites to return, including Sideshow Alley and rides to entertain. Coordinators urging everyone to get involved. Showbags will be here and the old McDonald's Animal Nursery, so, uh, and plus the Pets on Parade that should encourage a lot of kids and family groups to come along. Plus we've got the local talent, singers and bands. The show kicks off the second week in August and expects to attract upwards of 4,000 locals enjoying the day. Typical country show, you've got something for everyone. Jason Kemp, Southern Cross News. Well, the weather's looking fairly decent this weekend, so if you're planning to cast a line in, let's see what's biting out on the Gulf waters. Here's this week's Fish and Tips. <laughs> Welcome to another week around the Gulf Fishing Tips from Port Pirie. You know, fish have got a bit of a cycle thing happening, and what we've found at the moment, usually in the mid part of the season, they sort of go off the bite around the creek areas, and they end up over in Barrows Beach. So that's where you need to go at the moment if you want to catch yourself a feed of King George. Also look at the top end of Ward's Pit while you're there. And I've been told from good advice that there's some snook out there, which are a bit early. We don't usually see them till September, but a lot of fun to have as you want to trawl for them on the way home if it's a bit rough. And don't forget our squid there, just going fantastic at the moment. G'day and welcome to this week's fishing tips around the Gulf. Well, a bit of everything, a bit of wind and some really calm conditions at the moment. Really nice to uh, float along the front of the shacks for squid, as always this time of year. Some big kingfish up around the, the railway bridge at the top of the Gulf. They've been spotted, but they really haven't been taking too many baits there. Uh, some snapper down around the seabird, salmon up in the creeks around Chinaman's Creek and also Port Patterson as well. There are a few King George whiting around. Uh, they're fairly big but uh, not great numbers. Not a lot to report. We've had some pretty bad weather and also the dodge tides have been in effect as well. Um, but seeing the weekend, the weather's coming in good. The tides are coming in a lot better. Um, so I can probably only give you some good areas to target. There has been a few undersized whiting caught today. Um, no real big fish but if you move around and work through the grounds, you should be able to find some bigger fish amongst them. Those areas have been down towards Mount Young and Cowlitz Landing a little bit further south. Um, for the land-based anglers, still again, there's been a lot of salmon around the Point Lowly area and also down towards Becky Point. G'day, welcome to this week's fishing tips from Port Lincoln. Starting up around Arno Bay and Port Neal, there's been some big whiting up there, but the squid have been a little bit hard to find. And there's a few small snapper and some flathead. Down around Tummy Bay is a similar story. There's some whiting out around the group and some flattered down along the beaches down south. The squid have been a little bit tough, but afternoons have been the time to try. Down around Port Lincoln, the uh, squid have been doing really well in the bay. Whiting have been better outside the bays, both north and south of the town. Down along the south coast, last weekend we had some good northerlies and the guys got into some good salmon catches down there. Uh, that's all for this week. We'll be back with more fishing tips next week. Well, stay with us after the break. A look at your Friday forecast and the weather for the weekend. Welcome back. Turning to the weather now, a mainly fine and mild day today with 18 the top in Port Augusta and 16 for Wyala and for Port Lincoln. Port Perry also 16 degrees the top, 14 today in Broken Hill. On the national satellite image, patchy clouds still keeps pushing across easterly. Behind it, we've got mainly fine skies. Out on the waters, the winds to 20 knots and to the north, the seas to a metre and a half in southwesterly. Sunrise is at 20 past seven. So a sunny 21 for Port Augusta tomorrow with 20 the top in Wyala and in Port Lincoln. Port Perry fine on 19 degrees and a sunny 16 in Broken Hill. Then looking ahead at how the weekend is shaping up sunny skies all round. Port Lincoln with 21 for Saturday, then 18 degrees on Sunday. Much the same for Cleveland, fine into next week also. Woodner 23 on Saturday and 21 degrees expected on Sunday. Wyala with a fine and sunny 21 for Saturday, with Sunday getting to a top of 20 degrees. 22 both days for Port Augusta this weekend. Much the same into next week as well. Kadena 19 for Saturday and then 17 degrees expected on Sunday. 
Port Pirie looking like much the same, 20 then 19 over the weekend and 20 as well on Monday. 17 then 16, so just a touch cooler for Clare. Broken Hill a sunny 19 degrees for Saturday and 21 degrees expected on Sunday. And that is the local news for this evening. Don't forget, as always, you can stay up to date with us on Facebook and on Twitter. You can also drop us an email and catch past bulletins online as well. We'll see you back here tomorrow night from 6.30. I'm Tim Hadfield from the team here at Southern Cross News. Have a good evening. Good night.